Hello, and thanks for joining our Natus Peloton e-seminar series. My name is Mary Ormson. I'm Medical Education Manager at Natus Medical Incorporated. Today's presentation is entitled, Hearing Loss, From Detection to Intervention, presented by Dr. Luis Fernando Escobar. Dr. Luis Escobar is currently Medical Director of the Medical Genetics and Neurodevelopmental Center at Peyton Manning Children's Hospital in Indianapolis. He is a medical geneticist and neonatologist. He is the chairman for the Genetic Section Duties Book Review Service. Dr. Escobar's primary research interests include neonatal perinatal medicine, clinical genetics and dysmorphology, craniofacial genetics, and hypoxic ischemic cell injury. He's authored more than 120 book chapters and has peer-reviewed articles that have brought national recognition to his work. He also has made numerous presentations at conferences throughout the United States and abroad. Dr. Escobar completed his pediatric residency and postdoctoral fellowships in clinical genetics and neonatology at Indiana University Medical Center. He's a member of the Indiana State Advisory Committee for Genetics and Genomics, and he is a consultant to the Molecular and Clinical Genetics Advisory Committee at the, of the FDA CDRH ODE in Washington. Dr. Escobar's expertise in genetic disorders has led him to two awards from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Edwin L. Gresham Award, Advancing Care of Infants, and the Virginia Wagner Memorial Award, Award for Legislative Efforts, Volunteerism, and Lifetime Service to Children. In 2015, Dr. Escobar was awarded Physician of the Year by the March of Dimes. Woo! Thank you so much, Dr. Escobar, for taking time away from your extremely busy schedule to join us today to share your expertise. I will now turn the presentation over to you. Well, thank you. I, I hope everybody can hear me well. I, I appreciate the introduction. It was very nice. Um, one of the things that I tell people all the time for me, hearing loss has been a close subject just because my wife is an audiologist, so I get these discussions with her all the time. Uh, so it, for to carry those discussions with her, I have to be well informed. <laughs> but hearing loss is one of those things that have been neglected for a long time. It was not until the 1960s when we became aware of the need as a as a healthcare system to take care of people with hearing loss. One of the things that uh, is confusing these days still is the fact that hearing loss can be classified in many ways. Now, it is a national problem and it's a healthcare problem because it affects nearly one in 500 children. In our hospital, for example, we have approximately 6,000 deliveries a year. Any of these is of one in 500 is real. You will see about 12 children a year with sensory neural hearing loss. It is the most common sensory disorder in children. And even then, we don't appreciate the influence of the loss of hearing in the developmental outcomes and functioning in the society group that we have developed. So when you talk about hearing loss, you can talk about congenital or early onset. You can talk about bilateral or unilateral. You can talk about isolated and non-isolated, but those are terminologies that have been developed with time depending on your perspective. So you can have a classification depending on the functionality of hearing loss and also a severity of the hearing loss. So functional hearing loss has been classified as sensory neural, conductive, mixed, or auditory neuropathy. The severity, it tells you about the functional uh, 
consequences of the loss, and it could be mild, moderate, severe, and profound. So to complicate the issues, then you can have unilateral or bilateral, prelingual or postlingual, and all those terms are, are usually self-explanatory. But people have adapted this terminology depending on what their subject of study is. So you can do symmetrical or asymmetrical, progressive or sudden onset, fluctuating or stable. But one of the things that have been obvious in the past few years is that in general, the most acceptable concept will be that you can have congenital hearing loss or delayed onset hearing loss. And that speaks more about the causes of hearing loss and how we have determined the etiology of hearing loss. Now, one of the things that happened um, in the early, in the late 80s and early 90s is that people recognized that we needed to have a more formalized program for the detection of hearing loss affected uh, people. This movement started actually in the 1960s, but it didn't become formal until the 1980s. And in 1990, uh, the establishment of the Early Hearing Detection and Intervention Committee um, or program gave us so much information. And for the first time, we have the ability to detect at young age uh, affected children with hearing loss. So the intent was that the early detection the better outcomes. So Eddie has established now that all babies should be screened by for hearing loss no later than one month of age. Now, and if you are born in a hospital, the patient needs to be screened before discharge from the hospital. But if you are born in a home or in a midwife facility, those facilities may not have the ability to test hearing right then. So the guidelines suggest that the baby should be tested within one month of age. If a baby does not pass a hearing screen, then a full hearing evaluation should be done and hearing loss should be confirmed or ruled out by three months of age. And the reason is because at three months is a crucial uh, age for development the loss of hearing can affect then developmental skills that are essential for future functioning. So the, the amount of incredible data that this provided to us clinicians was incredible. But it essentially it divided the hearing loss into congenital, acquired, late onset, and progressive. So in the late onset children, which are not picked up at the early detection program in the newborn period, then those children with risks need to be tested by two to two and a half years of age. So I have introduced this here a new concept. So Eddie gave us the ability to, to develop some groups of people that were at risk for hearing loss. And when, you did, when we did that, then we recognized there were risk factors in the newborn period that predispose patients for hearing loss of late onset. So we recognized certain factors. We recognized that exposure to infections, such as infections before birth, could cause hearing loss of late onset. A risk factor was children that spend more than five days in the NICU at a risk of hearing loss of late onset. And that may be related to the hypoxic event or medications that they receive in the NICU. Maybe they have received blood exchange transfusions due to jaundice at a risk of hearing loss. Craniofacial dysmorphism is a big sign, especially for me, that I'm a geneticist. In addition to neurologic disorders that we known to be associated with hearing loss. Obviously, infectious diseases in the newborn period is a huge risk factor like meningitis and encephalitis. Head injury is one of those things that could occur at any time, including 
birth, it, the traumatic delivery, uh, but it also postnatal life can cause a lot of trauma, which may place patients at risk of hearing loss. So if we look at this concept, Eddie has providers with the ability to recognize children at birth, and he's given us the data to develop risk factors that places children at risk for hearing loss at a later age. But the reality is that one in four cases of hearing loss, the, ca the cause of a hearing loss is not known. Even now we can recognize them, but we cannot truly make a diagnosis of the cause of hearing loss. And this is when I talk to people about hearing loss being a symptom and not a diagnosis. So usually you can recognize that hearing loss may be a secondary effect of a primary event. And those are the kind of things that I think in the future the EDI data is going to, able, is going to be able to show us uh, to determine the causes of hearing loss. Now, interestingly though, one out of two children is currently known to be due to a genetic cause. Now, remember that genetic causes can be mild, it can be severe. So a lot of the children that we think that isolated hearing loss, they may have some other findings that eventually will give us the genetic diagnosis. And I'm going to give you some examples later in the talk. One in four children may be related to epigenetic factors. Now, for the non-geneticist people in the audience, epigenetics is the ability of the environment to change gene expression uh, without changing the gene sequence. So there is no mutations here, but the environment is able to change the expression of the gene when maybe it's not supposed to be expressed, and that could cause birth defects or sometimes a specific functional deficits like hearing loss. So to study the genetics of hearing loss, it has become not only complicated, but fascinating. One of the best studies that I found in the past uh, years, uh, and this is a study by Dr. Sujan in 2008, what he did, he asked the question, how many genes does it take to form the ear? Well, he used embryonic tissue at different stages in the formation of the ear and looked for gene expression. He found that more than 5,000 genes change expression through the inner ear embryogenesis. And that changed not only at different points during the pregnancy, but also changed permanently during the pregnancy. So the outcome of the gene expression may have had multiple functions at different stages of ear formation. He identified that close to 983 genes were candidate genes, candidate genes for human deafness. So this is not hard of hearing candidate genes. These are human deafness candidate genes. So that is a huge amount of genes. And right now, the limit uh, the number of conditions that we know that cause hearing loss is limited because we still need to work on the data of recognizing people with hearing loss and depending who evaluates those patients to recognize the symptoms and the specific findings that would allow us to determine the etiology of the hearing loss. So there is a website which is called the Online Mendelian Inheritance of Men. And when you... Uh, query the, the database, um, you can find that 20 to 40 percent of all children with hearing loss have other disabilities. Now, they may be minor disabilities that in the past were not uh, thought to be related to hearing loss, but now we are recognizing more and more that these are findings that can be linked to the etiology of hearing loss. Now, interestingly, the database also suggests that 900 genetic conditions have been described to include hearing loss 
and other special needs. Now, if you compare that to the study that I previously showed you, that suggests that 900 genes are candidate genes for deafness, and now we have a clinical database that tells us that 900 genetic conditions have been described. So there is a nice correlation there between both data systems. 802 conditions have been described to present with deafness and other special needs. So the question now is, now having all this information and data and analyzing this data, I think would allow us to recognize that isolated hearing loss may not be the most common form of hearing loss in the future. I believe that as we get to know the population, as we get to evaluate patients more carefully, uh, we'll be able to recognize that most of the time, the expression of genes in hearing may have some influence in other functional systems of the body. So to form the hearing system, you have to have cell proliferation, cell migration, and cell differentiation. So those are complex, complex systems that are required in biology to form any system in your body. But to do that, you have to have an incredible amount of genetic programs that need to work perfectly to everything to work right. So it's incredible that all of us are here listening to this webinar, and they are, we are functionally, we're learning, but if you are here, it's because by natural selection, the pro genetic programs have worked very well. Uh, and your system is functioning well for you to be able to function in the system that we, the so-called normal people, have created. So if you do that, then we need to look at actually gene expression carefully. So. The stud, this is study, which was done in 2012 by Dr. Chen, he was interested again in how many genes not only take part in the formation of the ear, but that are actually expressed in, uh, in the formation of the ear, but that are expressed in other tissues too. So he collected mouse cochlears. And he examined these cochlea by microarray and gene expression technology. And he found that through the pregnancy, more than 10,000 genes were expressed at any point in time. That is a complex system, meaning that if a gene is expressed during the pregnancy, may cause an effect in the baby, and what we see postnatally may not be an active gene causing it, but it will be something that failed before. Now the gene is done with the activity, with the expression. Uh, what we see is the leftover or the failure of a specific program to function properly at one point in time. So gene expression is very important, but it's not just about expressing a gene in, in, at one point in time. Through life, we express genes all the time. Our environment makes us express genes all the time. Uh, the expression of genes may be turned off or turned on, depending on the predisposition that we have to certain disorders. Or that's, some people uh, speculate that that's how some genetic disorders don't show up until later in life. So late expression of genes may lead to late onset genetic disorders, and that may be the cause of some cases of late onset hearing loss. So let me give you an example. This is the EGPF expression uh, gene, and somebody look at the uh, expression of the gene in different tissues. Now, we have the ability to stain a protein that is expressed when the gene is being um, expressed, and I'm, I'm sorry for the wording, but so when a gene is expressed, there is a protein secretion. When that protein occurs, that protein has a function in a specific tissue. So when you, you look at the EGPF expression, you can see that at some point in time in the embryo, it's expressed in the statoacoustic ganglion, in the basal turn of the cochlea, the tip of the digits, 
and the nasal oral epithelia. So if you look at the pictures on the left side, that involves eminently four systems of these sensory systems. So the nasal oral epithelia may be involved in the sensation of taste in the olfactory system, the tip of the fingers in the tactile stimulation reception, and of course, hearing in the cochlea. So it seems that the, this gene is, is highly expressed in tissues that are required for sensory input, and sensory, physical sensory input that allows the brain to receive and process information. On the other side, you'll see that it's expressed in the autocyst, when the, when the ears are starting to form, the vibrissae, which forms the inner ear cell villi, and in the amniotic membrane, which is an interesting fact, but we don't know exactly why it is expressed in the amniotic membrane. So what happened with the gene expression gets deregulated? Well, I think it would be like driving in a city without stop sign or driving in a city with one-way signs. Can you imagine? You wouldn't be able to know where to go, or if you know where to go, you wouldn't be able to get there because there would be accidents all the time, or there's gonna be chaos in the way we drive. So the same thing occurs with uh, genetic expression. If a gene gets deregulated, then the gene becomes crazy. So there are genes that are set to prevent abnormal growth, and when that gene is deregulated, growth occurs abnormally. And that's probably the best example that I can give you is the regulation of the gene for neurofibromatosis. When the expression of the gene goes crazy because it's not regulated anymore, so patients develop the cafe of the spots, which is on the left, and also they develop growths in the skin, which are called neurofibromas. And in some cases, there may be growth uh, affecting the cochlea, which in the past, we used to think that neurofibromatosis type 2 was the only one linked to hearing loss because of acoustic neuromas. Now we know that neurofibromatosis in general could cause hearing loss for other causes by abnormal growth in the cochlea. But in neurofibromatosis type 2, we used to think classically that the hearing loss was due to uh, acoustic neuromas. This is a very nice study which shows that, well, not quite true. So, um, and you study the ears of, of patients with neurofibromatosis type 2, you find, you find out hearing loss in 38.2% of the patients. From those 38 to percent of the patients, you will see that there is a cochlear block in the aperture of the cochlea, and there is also sometimes the presence of intralabyrinthine tumors and elevated protein in the cochlea, which doesn't allow the exchange, ion exchange properly, which we know also the causes dysfunction of the inner cell villi. When that occurs in the inner ear, then the, the sound is not transmitted properly. So we are learning about all these disorders. We are learning about how genetics may affect the function and the structure of the inner ear. And if the gene is expressing other parts of the body at the same time, you may have link findings that may be explainable in the future. So one of the things that Eddie has done, brought awareness that surveillance of hearing loss should be multidisciplinary. So in the old days, hearing has been the domain of the ENT specialists, or the ear, nose, and throat specialists, with the assistance of the audiologists. Now we know that we need to have a wider uh, view. And of course, the audiologists and the ENTs continue to be the in charge people because they will deal with the treatment of these uh, patients, but also we need to find out why the hearing loss occur to be able to predict complications and prevent further uh, conditions that may be linked to the cause of hearing loss. So we are able now to recognize different populations. So not all people with hearing loss are the same. Well, that's true for everything. No, 
all of us are the same. We have different genetics, different genetic messages. But the recognition of populations at risk is so important now because now we can help people to increase their longevity, prevent complications from thyroid disease, from blindness, from renal disease, for pancreatic disorders that can be linked to hearing loss. So there's two more examples of hearing loss as a symptom and not a diagnosis. So when you look at cerebral palsy, cerebral palsy will be also a, a, a symptom and not a diagnosis. Autism, now these days, we know that autism is not a diagnosis. It is a diagnosis for the insurance companies, but we know that clinically autism is a symptom of an underlying condition. And we are uncovering more and more situations where it is a genetic cause. So let me give you a couple of examples uh, clinically and how genetics is changing the field of hearing loss. We have this patient that was uh, referred to our center. Uh, it was a full-term baby with a complicated pregnancy. It was referred because the baby didn't pass the newborn hearing screen. He was diagnosed with bilateral sensory neural hearing loss by six weeks of age. By the way, if you look at the picture of the baby, you don't see necessarily dysmorphic findings or anything unusual. Baby looks perfectly okay. So he was sent to the ENT medical group, and they did a physical exam, and they suggested it was unremarkable. The parents didn't have any concerns. Of course, babies have elemental skills at that time. And they tested him for connexin 26 and connexin 30, which is the probably the most common form of genetic hearing loss. And the testing was negative. So they diagnosed him with isolated hearing loss. So at a later age, there were some concerns on renal function. And after referring patient to first steps, the therapist noticed that the, the patient had a strong urine and they were concerned about urinary function because sometimes he was spending a lot of time with that urine output. And he was referred to, uh, he was referred to genetics. When we look at the baby, we actually notice a, a periauricular pit, and the periauricular pit immediately made me think of brachiotorenal syndrome. Now, because I had experience of looking at periauricular pits, I got lucky and I found the periauricular pit that gave me the clue. And I knew that BOR is a common genetic disorder um, that is due to three genes, EYA1, 61, and 65. And it's associated with brachial cleft cysts, abnormal pits, ear anomalies, and hearing loss. But the most important thing that concerned me was if this baby wouldn't come to our clinic, then we wouldn't have been able to detect the following. So BOR is highly involved in renal failure, in renal anomalies. So before I did genetic testing, we wanted to know more history on the family. And it turned out that the patient with the arrow is our baby who was wasting protein in the kidney by the time he got to our clinic. And when we look at the family or the relatives, the mother had mild sensory neural hearing loss that was never picked up. And when you look up to the maternal grandfather had hearing loss, cleft palate, and a bifid uvula. And the mother had a sister with polycystic kidney disease and hearing loss. And we can go through the whole family, but the point is that we were able to track hearing loss in the family, which hasn't been done before in this particular case, uh, and also talk to them about the risk of renal disease. Um, so we had another case, and this is uh, a little bit more complex because he was a patient referred by ENT it was uh, a, a kid that originally was 35 weeks gestation. Uh, he spent two months at the NICU, so people felt that um, she had developed torticollis that we usually see in prematurity. Uh, because of feeding problems, the baby received a gastrostomy tube, 
and re require a pacemaker at that point um, because of the repair of the ASD and BSD cause heart dysrhythmias. So there was also some heteronormalities, but again, the patient was not sent to genetics at that point after discharge from the hospital, but it was sent to ENT, and ENT recognized that this was a little further and deeper than just hearing loss. But they attempted to do genetic testing, um, and they said, well, let's send for Pendred syndrome testing. But the insurance company said, well, no, um, you don't, we won't approve genetic testing until you see a clinical geneticist, which it was nice, but I think they could have done the testing, the proper testing, but uh, we got to see the patient, which if you look, she has a significant short neck, and when we tried to manipulate her neck, she was fixed, which is rare for torticollis to be that fixed. So we requested some imaging studies, and there was cervical fusion of C1, C2. There was retrolysthesis of C3, C4, C6, and C7 fusion. Uh, there was a speech-language delay, hand abnormalities, and that was compatible with the diagnosis of clinical file syndrome. At that point, I didn't feel we needed more genetic testing because we had a, diagnostic, uh, a diagnosis, and we knew what to expect from the syndrome. But again, it took two years on this patient to get the correct diagnosis. Later on, we have worked the family up on genetics, and we have recognized their genetic defect. So I want you to get a feeling that you have normal children and normal people, apparently normal people looking, uh, they have hearing loss. And this is Erica. Erica is one of my famous famous patients because she was 16 when she came into us and she was referred because she had bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Very cute, 16-year-old, uh, very happy and vivacious. Uh, right now, she's in college now. But when we look at her, um, we thought, well, we're just going to do a panel for hearing loss because it seems isolated from the referral. What it turned out that when we saw her, we actually found that she had digit contractures. So her fingers were contracted. She could not extend her fingers. And that caught my attention significantly. So this is called camptodactyly, when you cannot extend the digits like that, which in association with hearing loss, I thought it was very unusual. So she had gone to the Shriner Hospital in Chicago, and they have done surgeries on this fingers, but they could not fix them, and actually the contractures recur. So we did a uh, search in the literature, and we found a condition denominated Cachel syndrome, and uh, there was just one single family in the whole world reported with this in the literature, and it's called Cachel because um, a contracture or camptodactyly, tall stature, and hearing loss. So when I saw this paper, I thought, hmm, I wonder if Erica will fit this this situation. So I called their family and I convinced them to get genetic testing, particularly that her family history was significant from hearing loss. And then we realized they have a lot of family affected with contractures also. So it turned out that Erica was positive for for this gene. So she was she became the second family so far that has been reported, and it confirms that this mutation actually causes a syndrome that involves tall stature, camptodactyly, and hearing loss. Again, she's a college student. Cognitive function is completely normal, but she did go through a lot of orthopedic pain. Uh, that we could have explained by genetics and guide the surgeries better. So the interesting fact, and this is just a fun fact, this gene, a fibroblast growth factor receptor 3, is the same gene that causes achondroplasia all the little people of America. So we have a gene that has different mutations, and different mutations can give you different 
phenotypes, you can get tall or you can get short. So that's how genetics is changing and how amazing the knowledge that we're gaining is discovering how our genome works. This is a, a baby that I saw in the neonatal unit and she progressively developed a prominent forehead. And you can say that the eyes look sunken because the forehead became more prominent. Uh, when we look at her, she actually had developed early fusion of the cranial sutures, and we suspected that she had something called Munke syndrome, uh, and that was because so it was an asymmetric cranial synostosis. When you look at Munke, uh, they are at high risk of progressive sensory neural hearing loss. We tested her. She was developing uh, sensory neural hearing loss, and over the years, she has progressed further and further uh, on her hearing deficit. But we were able to, what, what I want you to look at is the picture from the beginning to the picture at the bottom. There is a striking difference. In the beginning, she didn't look exactly dysmorphic like at the bottom. But at the bottom, you can see that her cranial facial structures have changed significantly. And that's related to surgery, but also to her syndrome itself. Now, all of us, all of us have patients that present with small jaw, cleft palate, and that's called Pierre Robin sequence. Now, in in the early 80s, there was a professor in in Indiana University that actually trained me, Dr. Bixler, and he actually collected information on these patients, and he found that 40% of the kids with small jaw and cleft palate will have something called Stickler syndrome. When we started uh, looking at Stickler syndrome patients, it turned out that uh, almost 60% of them will have sensory neural hearing loss that will respond well to amplification devices. This is a patient that when he came to us, he didn't have the micrognathia anymore. The cleft palate had been repaired. The only thing we had was hearing loss and the history of a repaired cleft palate. So we suspected that this could be Stickler syndrome. We tested him, and we did find a mutation in the col 2A1 gene. We confirmed the diagnosis of Stickler. Now, you're going to say, so what does that mean? What is the importance of doing that? Well, these patients are at risk of retinal detachment and blindness, and also significant involvement of the kidneys as they get older. So the, making the diagnosis will allow us to develop a preventive care plan for him for years to come. Now, one of the most striking stories in, in recent years is the susceptibility gene to gentamicin. So if you are familiar with antibiotics, there is a group of antibiotics called aminoglucosides. If I give aminoglucosides to anybody, then you should be okay. And actually, it's a life-saving medication. However, if you have a mutation called A1555G in the mitochondrial genome, then you may develop, may develop hearing loss. And the reason is because if you have that gene, the inner ear hair cells, when they receive uh, gentamicin, they get wiped up. So in the left is a normal cochlea. In the right, on the right, there is a cochlea treated with aminoglucoside, so you can see that it's being wiped, wiped up completely. Now, this is striking because how are we going to treat this cochlea? Obviously, some of these patients respond well to uh, cochlear implants, but in the future, I think that it's exciting to know that there is maybe hope with gene expression genes. So somebody understood that, for example, birds can regenerate the hair cell receptors in the cochlea. So why can humans do it? Well. It is because probably the predisposition mutation doesn't allow us to regenerate those hair cell receptors. But when you do studies of a gene called MAT1 expression, 
and you overexpress this gene in the cochlea, and that's the overexpression is is color orange. You can see that a new lining of hair cells are starting to form and regenerate in the cochlea. So in the future, I think, in some cases of hearing loss, we'll be able to use gene overexpression to repair the damage of the cochlea or in the ear, villi, or other forms of sensory neural hearing loss related to genetic disorders. This is exciting because uh, it will avoid complex surgical procedures if we can develop this form of gene therapy. So I want to talk to you about the genetic approach to a patient with hearing loss. So there is a difference between genetic testing and genetic evaluation. So genetic evaluation is a little bit more complex. So the genetic evaluation will look at the family history of a patient. It will look at the past medical history. It will look at current medical records, the age of presentation, the natural history, and more importantly, will provide a physical examination from the genetic trained eye and will provide the information for diagnostic management. So when the patient comes to our clinic, the patient has this morphologic exam. If the team uh, agrees that the hearing loss is isolated, then we do testing like autochips, which is a panel of the most common genes known right now to be causing hearing loss. And then we provide clinical follow-up, and sometimes we go further and do metabolic testing. Now, if the hearing loss is associated with a recognizable syndrome, then we do targeted gene testing, and we provide clinical follow-up directed specifically to the syndrome that we are managing to prevent comorbidity. Now, there is hearing loss that we cannot find. There are other findings that we cannot recognize such as genetic syndrome. So we start with basic genetic testing like microarray analysis, karyotype, and right now we do exome sequencing, which is a, one of the newest techniques. Very promising for the future, but it's still very complex. So again, once we have an evaluation, we can decide on the testing. And these are the techniques that we use. For example, the auto chip, and this is just one that I pulled a um, long time ago. And in, in those days, it included 90, days, 90 genes. Now it includes almost 140 genes um, and of the most common forms of hearing loss uh, that are isolated, but they can have comorbidity. We don't use karyotype anymore, but some of the gross unemployed like trisomy 18, trisomy 21, we still diagnose them with karyotype. And we use a lot of microarrays, which looks at the lesions or pieces missing and pieces duplicated in the genome. And of course, what is getting more and more popular is the exome sequencing, which sequence uh, the protein, the encoding regions of the genes to see if we can find mutations that explain a genetic cause of hearing loss. I want to leave you with a message. So non-syndromic hearing loss comprises about 70% of genetic cases. So isolated hearing loss, it could still have a genetic basis, and it's more likely to be genetic than other other causes of uh, hearing loss. So right now, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Medical and Genetics recommends that any patient with hearing loss should be evaluated by a geneticist, and testing should be planned accordingly. Um, I don't want to overwhelm you. I know I gave you a lot of information, a lot of things that you probably hear for the first time. Uh, and I want to leave you with the question of how all the information Eddie has provided uh, now is affecting what we do in our clinical practice. And I'm going to stop there. Well, thank you very much. That was extremely informative and very engaging, and I'm sure everyone, uh, we have several participants in the, in the internet classroom, and I'm sure they all agree that that was great. Um, I will encourage people, if they have questions, to enter them into the chat box, and we have about 
10 minutes left in the presentation. I have a couple of questions for you already. One question, how do you manage referrals for genetic evaluations uh, for patients who are living in rural areas? So we have started a telemedicine program. So I think in the future we'll be able to see the patients through telemedicine. Um, we put them in contact with audiologists that can do the assessments and then they help us out to, to get a referral. Um, we have gone out there to educate providers so we get the referrals or if, if, if the patient cannot come to us then we are in the process of planning going to them so we have satellite clinics. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, one question was um, who should be referred for genetic testing but I think you answered that a few times during your presentation that all children with congenital hearing impairment should be referred for genetic evaluation and you clarified the difference between genetic testing and genetic evaluation. Another question though is other tests, say for example a family uh, is having a difficult time with their insurance company getting um, approval for a genetic evaluation and they need perhaps more evidence that it's needed besides the um, isolated hearing impairment. What other kinds of medical tests do you think should be routinely run on an infant after a diagnosis of congenital permanent hearing loss? Great question, because that's, uh, that's why we need to see those patients. So we, if we suspect renal dysfunction or we suspect pancreatic dysfunction or liver dysfunction, then we need to do testing for that, which gives you a clue and more power to get the insurance to approve genetic testing. So the first assessment would allow us to gather information to have the testing approved. Um, right now, we're, we're, we're lucky that we've been able to document enough findings to get more responsive insurance companies to, uh, to pay for the testing. So we're still in the process of, for example, Medicaid is always a little bit behind when it comes to change, but we are working with them to expand their codes to be used for genetic testing, particularly in hearing loss. Do you feel that any of the professional organizations, or maybe they already have, like the American Academy of Pediatrics or the American Academy of Otolaryngology or perhaps even the American Academy of Audiology would um, be coming out with any type of a position statement or um, best practice guidelines for medical management of children identified with congenital hearing impairment? So the American Academy of Pediatrics has guidelines already published. The American College of Medical Genetics has recommendations on management. Uh, I am not familiar with the American Academy of Audiology, but I know they are heavily involved in legislation. Um, so the, they're I think all of us have the guidelines available right now. Um, the problem is to educate the providers uh, in general. So the people involved in EDI, the people involved in hearing loss, we know exactly where to look for the guidelines, but it's been hard to get all this information to the general public um, and, and follow them. We okay. still have uh, difficulties with confirmation of hearing loss in a patient that didn't pass the hearing screen in some areas. So, or, or patients that have been lost to follow up because they don't follow the guidelines. Um, but the guidelines are out there. So there are, there are statements and positions to, to the management of people with hearing loss. Thank you. A couple questions about gentamicin. One, one thing you mentioned in your presentation is that there's been a gene identified that predisposes a person to damage from gentamicin. Um, do you see any time in the future? Is that is that a complicated test, or is it possible that prior to treatment with gentamicin, maybe that could be checked? Yes. So there is two. Actually, there is two mutations. One describing Asia, and the other one here in the United States. Um, and we brought up that point to the newborn hearing, the newborn screening program, 
and say, why don't we screen everybody for this um, susceptibility? Mm -hmm. So the answer, the answer was that if a baby gets an infection, and gentamicin is a life-saving antibiotic, then they're going to use it even if the susceptibility is there. So the argument is valid. If we need to save the baby by using gentamicin, despite the risk of, of hearing loss, then they're going to do it. So the neonatologists are very reluctant to not to treat babies because of the risk of hearing loss. Uh, because it's a life-threatening issue. So they are giving, it's a trade-off. So they're saying, we'd rather have a baby alive than a baby with hearing loss. So parents can request the test prenatally. They can request if uh, to know in case there is a complication in the delivery and the baby requires antibiotics. So they can request to be tested prior to the antibiotic use. But usually there are, there are, it's an emergency situation, so the patient needs to get the antibiotics quickly. So it's a very difficult question to answer mm -hmm. because there's a lot of factors involved. And so many times babies in the neonatal ICU are treated, um, it seems, almost prophylactically for, with five days of gent or 10 days of gent. Um, in those cases, and we don't know their susceptibility, is there a recommended time frame for doing the hearing screening after the, after the administration of JET, during the administration, or a period of time after? So the damage occurs pretty quick. So the babies, as soon as they get discharged from the NICU, within the next three months, they need to have a baseline hearing evaluation, uh, and then every six months for the first two years. Okay, so then perhaps the audiologist should utilize that as a, a and it is a high risk factor and follow that baby as a past but with risk factors and then follow up according to those guidelines. Correct. That makes sense. Correct. That makes Correct. sense. Another question, I think we have time for this one. Uh, what counseling and family support is provided after the diagnosis of a genetic problem or confirmation of a genetic condition? So in our clinic in this is what a lot of genetic practices are pushing for. So we follow and enroll the patients in what we call our surveillance program. So we see the babies uh, or the patients often um, to check with the parents what the needs are, what new information they require, what resources they need. Um, so we provide support once diagnosis is made, depending on what condition is diagnosed. But we don't just drop them. Um, I think in the old days, geneticists were diagnosticians and sent the patients on their way. Now we know that we need to take care of these patients. We need to follow them. We need to provide the support that they need. So we we follow in our clinic uh, all the way to adulthood if we need to. Very good. Thank you. Um, I don't see any. Let me just double check. No, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. So um, again, on behalf of Natus Newborn Care and Peloton Screening Services, Dr. Escobar, I want to thank you sincerely for your time today and your expertise. This was an excellent presentation. And um, for everyone that's listening in the, in the classroom still, please watch your email. When we have the final version of the recorded presentation available, everyone will receive a link to that presentation. And again, I thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. And this will end our meeting. Thank you so much.